As Danielle mentioned, my name is Michael Primo. I'm an artist, journalist, documentary producer. I, um, I also produce documentary films. I, I work with a journalist named Naomi Klein. I am, we're producing a film now called This Changes Everything, which is part of her book, that, which was released last year, um, as well as a sort of global impact engagement and distribution strategy um, and, and a series of features um, at newspapers around the world. I, um, but tonight I'm going to talk about uh, three projects that um, speak to this recent trajectory of, uh, of my work that, that talk about um, this quest I have or this sort of aspiration around collaboration and participation. I had worked for uh, NPR producing radio documentaries and was working for the Village Voice and uh, StoryCorps and doing a variety of these uh, sort of audio-based pr uh, projects as well as photographing projects and was troubled with what I felt like was this sort of anthropological extractive process that I felt was you know, sometimes at, at, at its worst, quasi-colonial, where, you know, we were sort of taking something from a community and then giving it to another community that didn't, uh, wasn't experiencing what, what we were taking from them in a way that I felt um, didn't do its, them service to the challenge of power that they were trying to address. So um, with the collaborator who I met while uh, producing radio documentaries, Rachel Falcone, we were traveling around the country and no matter what stories people were sharing, we felt that people were talking about home. But we, we didn't feel like how those stories were being shared were reflective of the way people were living in a way that sort of had a meaningful impact on their experience. And so we started this project called Housing as a Human Right. And the goal really was to um, connect diverse stories around shared experiences, looking for those common denominators. And the idea of housing as a human right was to connect diverse experiences around this fundamental meaning of home, dealing through the voices and experiences of people who live in the most tenuous states of home. Whatever that means, whether that's like a physical state or uh, some sort of metaphorical or, or figurative state. And from that work, we. Um, we produced uh, radio documentaries as well as photo essays. And, but in this, in this project, the, the, the outreach and engagement of how we got the stories had a degree of participation, but we would still sort of go away, produce these stories, produce these products, publish them. Um, and we were beginning to think about through the exhibition strategy, how we create an exhibition strategy that is participatory in nature and also is honest honestly represents the stories that are being shared through the process of engagement and uh, recording their stories. So we've recorded stories for Housing is a Human Right in New York, in New Orleans, in Philly, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe. And the idea was then uh, to be able to bring a body of work that creates this sort of global picture of the fight for home. And so we share these stories through a variety of different ways, in addition to the sort of traditional publishing like on, uh, on radio and our stories are sort of still broadcast regularly on PRX, which is a, uh, a public radio like wire service that if you have satellite radio, they put your, the stories in rotation. But we wanted to find ways to bring the stories to the people uh, so we could meet people where they're at. And so we did a, a series of installations. Um, one of them was uh, in partnership with the Laundromat Project at a fellowship uh, with this organization that is designed to help facilitate community-based installations with, uh, between communities and makers in community. And so we did a series of installations in laundromats. It was a captive audience. Um, so, and you know, people were happy that, that there was something different than Judge Duty playing on the TV. Um, and so basically what we did is we hung 36 by 24 uh, size photos throughout these spaces and we played about an hour of audio content that uh, would play about every hour to not drive the laundromat attendants too crazy uh, throughout the day. But it was, a, it, was a, it was an attempt to explore how, what an exhibition strategy would look like that, that at least through a gesture returns the stories from where they came from as a way to honor that experience in a way that we, th we feel is dynamic. Um, and then so we did a variety of other installations. One, we did one in Philly where we, we turned this uh, vacant storefront into the Office of Human Rights and marketed it as the Office of Human Rights. Um, and we did a series of town halls uh, meetings with community groups that were kind of you know, for lack of a better word, warring factions in this particular um, uh, neighborhood over some impending gentrification in the Chinatown neighborhood of, uh, of Philly. 
And what we did is through the sort of power of art and photography and conversation, brought people together and facilitated these nightly town halls over two weeks, asking people just three questions. We asked people, what does home mean to you? What do you love about your home? And what is your hope for the future of your home? To help sort of re-situate re people's relationship around this conversation of gentrification in a way that I think is, we, we hope is a little bit deeper and a little bit richer and gets this essential notion of power as it relates to the relationship of who owns land, who has the power to control land, and who has access to resources to be able to take out loan to, own, to buy land. And so um, that project uh, uh, was in Philly for a couple weeks. We did the same in Tampa and, and in South Africa. Um, thanks to the South African Broadcasting Service, they, they brought us down to do a series of stories on uh, the World Cup, but didn't want to broadcast any of the stories because we uh, ended up doing uh, these series on the displacement. And so we work with ETV, which is a cable network down there, to then broadcast the, neighbor the stories in the slums as a way of just sharing and, and stoking conversation that people in community felt left out of uh, when the World Cup was happening. So in this project, another thing that we were inviting people to do was we were exploring how people could leave artifacts of themselves, how people could, could like a, a, a fundamental position that I have is that people who are directly affected by a situation are the experts who are best equipped to be able to offer expert, expert testimony on their particular situation. And so we wanted to invite that level of expert testimony into these exhibitions um, on an interactive level. And we did this in a variety of ways. You could write on the wall. It was as simple as a pen and marker. And we began to explore with technology how you could leave artifacts of yourself. And so we partnered with MIT's Center for Civic Media, which is exploring ways to create technological apps and digital uh, solutions to be able to um, uh, facilitate civic media projects. And so we, we, we work with them as, a, as alpha prototypers, if that means anything to anyone, um, around a technology called Voho, which allow, they call it a mobile blogging platform. I had no idea what they meant when they said that to me. Um, but six months of uh, playing with it, I, I, it kind of dawned on to me that it was just a simple way to aggregate text messages, and, so, um, and specifically text photos. And so when, when Hurricane Sandy happened, we, know, we knew or we felt that this, was, this event was too big for, any, uh, for us to cover as individuals and too big for any one organization to really wrap their heads around. Um, and so we wanted to create a way that anyone who was impacted by the storm could sh contribute their stories. Uh, we absolutely uh, fight the term crowdsourcing um, and citizen journalism. Um, we, we, we think that those terms don't have the editorial considerations that we feel that we like to aspire to in terms of how we curate stories, how we work with contributors to help craft their stories in a relationship that an editor, ed an editor might. Um, one of our team is, a, is a, a writer, a really a written journalist, and she would work with the, the written submissions to really sort of copy out of them and help people tease out stories, find sort of um, um, corroborating information if it was something that we would syndicate with a with a, another partner and the only criteria that of uh, the submissions were they, the stories had to be first person stories you could produce someone else's stories but they had to be I statements not they they statements in the in the expression of the story and so um, we called it Sandy Storyline for two reasons. One was that um, we had a physical storyline, you could call an 800 number. We had the mobile texting technology. Um, you could contribute online in photo, video, audio, um, and written testimony. But it was also called Storyline because the idea was um, how do we connect all of these diverse experiences to create um, narrative through lines or tropes. So as people contributed stories and people begin to talk about displacement or they begin to talk about their loneliness or their, their togetherness, uh, you know, like Rachel, uh, Rebecca Solnick writes a lot about around these moments of disaster where, where there's these beautiful and surprising moments of humanity that completely betray the sort of fear that's beaten into us by our sort of popular perceptions of how people really act. But in these moments of extreme crisis, people show beautiful moments of coming together sometimes. And so um, in, this, in, this, in this project, the central question, the design question was how do we collaborate with millions of people to tell this story? And so um, we, we wanted to allow those millions of people's contributions. We did got nowhere near those millions of contributions. We got about 1,000. Um, and um, to create these different storylines that would really sort of bring us through uh, this experience in ways that would give people multiple avenues of entry into this particular uh, story. 
And so um, what's missing here, uh, that looks like I deleted that by accident, is, is process equals outcome. And so what, what we mean by that is, is often there, there's a lot of conversation right now, which is sometimes intimidating around sort of community engagement and audience engagement and media and tech and all this blah, 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 blah. And so we think that the essential of that, like, impulse that, that you see, exp that people see people experiencing is this idea that um, if you want your project to reflect the community, uh, if, in talking about these interactive participatory projects, if you want to create a project like this and have it be reflective of the community in which you're engaging, the process must absolutely mimic the outcome that you want to achieve. And so um, that for us was reflected in the way and all of these contribution pathways. Um, and contributions came from regular folks as well as you know folks like my friend Keisha Berry who was out shooting portraits of people in Rockaway and these other journalists. Like a privilege of New York is just amazing journalists that happen to be friends. Uh, friend Lucian Reed is a war photographer was like in like in the middle of uh, rising seas and got beautiful footage. And what we're doing is we're working to, um, to, to create a beautiful synthesis of the contributed content with the content that we produce in a way that hopefully when we, um, when, when we're finally sort of have the final product of this project, which I'll explain in a minute, um, it'll be not seamless because you'll be able to tell the aesthetic considerations and compositional choices that our people are making, but it, it creates a coherent story that you don't really tell the difference, and, and, that's, and that's important to us to honor the people who are contributing these stories, the experts in this situation. And so um, these are some of the, 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 cool, thank you. These are some of the, the photos that uh, people sent, sent in uh, via text message. So the outcome of this is we're launching an interactive documentary in 2016 that will be a little bit of a, what you might call a lean back experience. So you can sit there and watch it uh, like you might a, uh, um, a regular documentary with light points of interactions. Uh, this is youth collaborations. It was an important part of our investigation team was uh, plenty of these youth who had nothing better to do. So it was free labor for us. Uh, or I mean, we put them to work. Um, so um, yeah, some of the youth in, in uh, Coney, uh, Coney Island, Staten Island. Um, this is a sort of, if you go to the site that we have, we're beginning to uh, experiment how we place these stories in contrast to each other. And so this is an experiment we did with folks in uh, Katrina where we worked with the Mozilla Foundation and created these uh, interactive videos where there's light, light touches of interaction. So when you watch these stories, um, and you can see that um, on, our, on our website. And then the third outcome, the other outcome that we're doing is these live installations. So we bring the interactive experience into people's, uh, in, bringing people into community with each other. And so this was an installation we did at the six month anniversary. Um, and with the texting technology, people could contribute stories and within a couple minutes, their story would become part of the exhibition. And we were inviting uh, stories like that. And we have an exhibition now that's touring through public libraries um, into, in a, with affected libraries, uh, affected communities with the New York Public Library. Some other photos of that. And so um, this is another project which I'll probably talk more a little bit later, but this is an, uh, uh, this project that's documenting a community in New Brunswick, Canada that's fighting, it's an unlikely alliance between um, uh, indigenous people, in Acadian French-speaking folks and uh, Anglo um, English-speaking folks who are united to sort of protect their water and land against uh, potential fracking, which they see as a threat to their water. And the, the process of documentation was not incredibly participatory, although we, you know, we did spend time with these folks. But we're, the exhibition strategy um, is we're developing a, a North American tour, which is hopefully we'll also tour to other uh, places around the world, which is working in concert with communities affected by the threat of natural, ga natural gas uh, drilling in a way that hopefully can transform non-traditional spaces into avenues for uh, uh, forums for discussion and, uh, and education. So thank you very much. Well, as you can see, this is powerful. Stories coming from people with the penetration of cell phones today, going around and seeing so many stories would have never actually made it to such a platform where people would have even talked about it. The social impact or any sort of justice would have gone. And that's what derived everything which we do. That is what we do, we mind. 
the picture over here, the reason I wanted to choose this picture to first start talking about why did we decide on vMind when all the platforms which we saw in those videos exist. There's YouTube, there is Facebook. Actually, one of our very interesting video came from the official ministry of Ukraine, and they still had to post it out there to send their message out that this is what's really happening out there. Is a very big problem of discrimination. Only yesterday I was reading somewhere that Bulgarians believe that 85.6% of the news which comes from official Bulgarian channels actually are completely false. So if the state media is not giving you what's really truly happening back in your country and your own country people do not trust what's really happening and they have to call up their friends and family to actually get the same news, then why do all these billion dollar industry of Main Street media exist? Uh, so the discrimination, the problem which we saw all over Africa and Middle East made us realize that we need a platform which can provide us a choice, a freedom of expression, not as a choice, but as a right. Uh, we met uh, people all over the world have been using so many local platforms, so many uh, uh, platforms with anonymity, which a lot of the people across the world don't know. When I went to, uh, while I was in Egypt, right after the first wave of revolution, I realized that there have been over, uh, I think, 182 local blogs, groups, WhatsApp network, uh, Facebook groups. They kept on changing every week so that they can actually talk about things uh, without being discriminated. And by the end of it, 122 or 123 of them were still tracked down by the government, and over 800 people were jailed. Uh, because of using of those unsecured platform. Uh, people, as I said, people use different things. A lot of times, one of the biggest stories which actually hurt me was last year when there was a huge bombing going on between Israel and Palestine. Uh, the trending news for three days on Twitter was actually not about those bombing initially. It was about Justin Bieber change of hair color. And that's what everybody talked about. And every time I would go on Twitter and try to talk about it, 40 people or 120 people, if I actually had a picture from Jordan, uh, would like talk about it and tweet about it, and then the story would get lost. Until and unless CNN really didn't go, or really didn't go over there and started talking about it, people really didn't care what was happening, or they just didn't know what was happening to care about it. And those are all the basis for why we wanted a platform where people can people can actually be secure share their thoughts, and have a one-stop shop where people are not confused where to go. Like, for an example, there was a huge case of police brutality in Mexico with 42 people killed, and there's a footage where you can actually see that uh, the cops went ahead, they killed people, they did the pepper spray, they came back, and they never even cleared the bodies. And that video actually do not exist anymore on any of the platform. It was only available for two days, and it was taken down from everywhere. And uh, so those are the stories which basically make us feel like uh, if somebody wants to actually follow it, it will take them at least 10 days to figure out where to actually even see those stories. So the confusion, the dilution of the news, the competition with Kim Kardashian and Kenya West is too much to figure out in this world within two or three days where stories are so important for us. And that is why we plan to create a single effective medium, bring all the technology which we have learned, take the best of it and customize it for a platform which is important for social activism. Because so far there hasn't been a single global platform, especially in form of a Android and iPhone application where just by the touch of the screen you have access and you can create and change the way the stories are told and put a human angle to it. Um, those are the main four pillars for us for vMind. The choice of anonymity, the power of independent citizen journalism, bringing a lot of local communities around and put them on the international platform and having a freedom of expression without a country or a government deciding whether a particular story needs to get out of the borders or not. And filling this gap, um, it was um, something which we initially thought is going to be a three-month project. We will all do it. We'll create the platform. We'll put it out. And then we can go back to our hedge fund jobs. Um, it just didn't happen. It's been a year and a half. 
and vMind is still uh, teaching us every day the new features which people from other part of the world uh, requires and how do our, how are interestingly do, do they use it and every day when we read the stories we feel like this is a platform we need to spend our ears on. Um, one of the questions whenever I talk about vMind is a lot of people tell me well, it's amazing. It's yes, Egyptian revolution happened, Tunisian revolution happened. There were stories of Ferguson, uh, but do you really think there is a bigger platform which will continue growing and people will still talking about it? Um, we give them their own stats coming actually uh, uh, raised by Facebook, and we are like, you are looking at 15 million plus scattered active users who are already taking the risk every day, going on their local. Uh, social activism platform across the world and actually still contributing. So if we can give a much more secured platform, I don't even know how many people we can get together and actually create movements on the stories which never make it to the world. This is a, simp this is a small example of number of people, the amount of mass you are looking for. And these are the Facebook in internal stats. You are looking at 23% of uh, the 52.3 million Facebook users, which are already using Facebook with their identity attached and talking about social activism, you are already looking at around 12.8 or 13 million people just from Middle East and North Africa. And these are the numbers not even during revolution. These are the numbers as of last fiscal year. So moving ahead. Um, what we all, another thing about vMind is we go and actually partner with lots and lots of local platforms. These are a couple of examples of those local platforms we are working right now to partner with across uh, Africa, Middle East, India, a lot of individual corruption initiatives which we are trying to put together on one application so that when, um, so that when people go to one platform, they can actually literally go to each country, each region, based on the topics, and see what they want to follow instead of knowing five different or 200 different platforms. This is just to give you a little idea of how our app looks as of now. You have a choice of anonymity. You have an inbuilt system of search and follow where you can go to a region and a country or a topic, and you can literally go and uh, follow the news live in the way if somebody wants to follow harassment in Cairo, they can literally make that selection and follow it. And then how different action icons define the whole conversation around the topic. Um, we do not have a like button, as Mark Zuckerberg in every yearly conference try to figure out why does he have one, actually. Uh, we just say we have an I mind icon, where because every story needs support, and that's what we look for. Um, these are some of the features for our upcoming versions, uh, which is most, most important out of these are very strong language translation. We are working with the Google team back in San Francisco to test roll some of the very uh, individual languages, like three dialects in Arabic, couple of dialects in Swahili itself, uh, creating a whole pin drop helpline number so that wherever you are in the world, you don't, e you don't get only a standard um, COPS number or uh, hospital number but you also get a lot of NGOs around you which can actually help you in countries where police stations are not that helpful, actually. Um, one of the things which is most important for us is a backend security. So everything which we do, uh, we work with uh, EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is the biggest international security organization. So everything we do, we get it certified at the back end uh, to the extent that if somebody is using anonymous, uh, their local cell phone, our database, nobody saves anything after 10 minutes of them posting a news. So they can actually be anonymous. Um, this is just an example of type of uh, target audiences which we look at, people who contribute actively and people who read the, consume the news and then start taking it to the uh, interaction level. Our competitive edge, first of all, there is no other platform which is actually already there just for this gap. Uh, but our backend security, uh, partnering with going actually to the field, partnering with a lot of local organization, giving them all the technology to integrate with our system, and uh, going to local universities. We just launched our vMind program at Columbia Journalism School on April 17th, and we are doing the one at Stanford. So trying to get a lot of student movement from US also. Um, um, this is just some of the things I wanted to talk about. 
uh, the type of users which we are looking for and the offices. We already have an office in Nairobi in Egypt and uh, uh, those are our active offices where we see a lot of movements happening, especially in East Africa with elections coming up in two years and how uh, youths are actually going on the street and trying to change a regime in Tanzania which has been in power for 46 years now. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, we do have screenshots for the app, but I think if anyone is interested, we can talk about it later. The app is available on iTunes Store and launching on Android and web. Um, a one-stop shop for all the citizen journalism we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two previous speakers. Thank you guys very much. That was awesome. Um, one of the things that both um, uh, Kevin and Michael brought up, which I think needs to be um, mentioned a few more times this evening, and I'll just do it once, I promise, is that I think one of the things we forget about a lot is that um, activism and in a place like New York, we get caught up in the idea that we need to know what's going on in the world and we forget that there are places like Bulgaria um, where people need to just have activism amongst themselves. And I think that's something that we forget about an awful lot living here. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit different from the two previous speakers, which is why they put me at the end. Um, because I am gonna speak in a very sort of traditional photojournalism, about very traditional photojournalism. Um, when I was speaking to Danielle the other day, I was like, one of my mantras recently has been think inside the box. Like, I'm all about, like, the box these days. Like, it's all about three-act structures and traditional media. And that's not entirely true, and I'll, you know, later I'll talk about some other things that are a little bit more untraditional. But um, my background is, so I'm, a, I'm an American photojournalist. I was born and raised in New York, and I went out to Iraqi, well, Iraqi Kurdistan in, two, excuse me, uh, in 2008. And in 2009, my friend and I, he's an Iraqi photojournalist, Kamran, he and I started this Iraqi um, photo agency. And the idea was to build up a, to build up Iraqi photojournalism, which, you know, under 30 years plus of, uh, of dictatorship d didn't exist. Um, journalism itself, the concept of journalism didn't exist. So we were building from very, very little. We were building, starting in 2009, six years of war. Um, and with that mainly wire photography, and Iraqi photographers were being trained up and used by the wire agencies, but the more feature stuff, the longer stories, more in-depth stories didn't exist. And so what we decided to do, excuse me, my phone keeps going um, to sleep. Um, so what we decided to do was to reach out to all the different photographers we knew and to get them on board and to get them excited about real in-depth storytelling um, and the idea was not for them just to tell stories about Iraq, although with an Iraqi passport, there are a few other places that you can easily get to, um, to start there and then see, see where it went. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you a number of different photo stories that our photographers have produced recently. Um, so this is all starting since the, you know, the, excuse the alliteration, but the ISIS crisis. Um, and I'm gonna start off with a series of photographs that uh, one of our photographers, Zimnako, uh, did. He went to Mount Sinjar while the Yazidi were still on the mountain. He traveled from Iraq into Syria and then up along the border of Syria and then up to the mountain and then back again. Um, on, and no other journalist uh, did this. So I'm just gonna show you some of his photographs. Um, it took Zimnako about 48 hours to do this. After that, it became too dangerous and he had to leave. He had to come back into, into Iraq again, into the Kurdish region. Um, and this is one of those stories that only um, an Iraqi photographer um, or a local photographer could have done, speaking the language, being able to communicate with people um, and being able to navigate the, um, the situation um, very, I was gonna say covertly, but no, just subtly. Um, you can also tell by you know, his, his style that the guy has incredible talent um, in, in combination with, with immense bravery. Um, so 
unlike um, a lot of some of the things we're talking about this evening, which is finding new ways to tell stories or telling stories differently, I'm not actually that interested in new ways of telling stories. What I'm very interested in is talk is having listening, sorry, is listening to new storytellers, is finding those storytellers who have the talent and developing that talent and giving them a way to be seen by the world, which gets into platforms, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, in the panel discussion. But it is not about the idea of citizen journalism. Um, there is a, citizen journalism is very important in the 21st century. It just is, as you saw by that story filled video that, uh, that we saw earlier, that there are breaking news moments that um, everyday people with everyday technology need to record for us so we know what's going on. Um, but what I'm about is not that at all. Um, I recently saw a doctor, and he was not a citizen doctor. And I took a train, and it was not driven by a citizen conductor, you know? <laughs> and I think that a lot of photographers um, don't, aren't, I mean, photographers don't need to be professional photographers when they're capturing breaking news moments, but if they're gonna tell moving stories, they need to have talent and they need to have training and they need to have practice and they need to have oversight. And we need to give photographers the time and the respect to develop that. Um, so that is, well, my phone falls asleep. Um, I will now move on to a story that um, one of my favorite photographers, just because he's an amazing guy and I hope someday I'll get a visa for him and you can all meet him. Uh, Aram Karim, he spent five years, almost unbeknownst to himself, working on a story. He's from a very small village up on the Iraq-Iran border up in the Kurdish mountains. And just by enjoying photography and taking pictures, he's ended up doing a five-year project about smugglers along uh, the Iraqi-Kurdish border, so Syria, Turkey, and Iran. And watch this space, because it will be appearing in the New York Times Lens blog at the end of the month. <laughs> um, so I'll show you the photographs from his project, or some of the photographs. This was taken, this was uh, at the very beginning of the Syrian war in the winter. These were Syrian Kurds who were um, smuggling uh, refined petrol, so gasoline, back into Syria, which um, um, once they'd run out, so this, this, is, this is them um, taking it back through the snow. And it ends with a series of portraits he did of the smugglers. Um, and you can see by that, I mean, by the time of day, by the amount of time it took. I mean, this is something that takes five years, and this is not something that, unless you do move to another country as a Western journalist for over five years, and who would do something as silly as that? Um, never mind, forget it. <laughs> um, that, that you need someone who is dedicated and who lives in the community to, to produce it. Um, Moving much more into, into um, the recent, I, as I said, the, the crisis with, with ISIS. Um, I'm sorry, that sounds terrible. Um, uh, one of our photographers did a story on the female Peshmerga, the Iraqi Kurdish military that have a female unit. Um, as different from the Syrian Kurds, which is a different fighting force. Um, but he was able to tell a story in, in such depth where it wasn't just women in uniform fighting, but spent time in the house, um, in the market, and, um, and at home. So th again, these are the stories that, need, that don't necessarily need to be told, but are best told by people who know the culture very, very well and can integrate into it and get that level of intimacy and access. But Pajar, the guy who took this picture, I have known him for five years, and he was not able to take a picture like this five years ago. This has been training, this has been workshops, this has been a lot of one-on-one -on -one and a lot of talk over the years. Um, and then I'll, I'm concerned about time, so I'll go through this a little bit more quickly. This is a story, um, one of the, where I m move out of 
traditional, what I said, thinking inside the boxes. There are some stories that have a breadth and size to them that you can't tell in a newspaper article or even in a um, online slideshow that needs something a little bit more. So one of the things that we're working on, the largest project we're working on at Metrography right now is a, a project we call a map of displacement. And what we're doing is we're collecting a huge number of stories, but really beautifully produced photo stories about the IDP, the inter internally displaced people's crisis that's happening in Iraq right now. Um, Iraqi Kurdistan has a population of about 5 million, and over the past nine months, 1.2 million people have fled to the region. Um, the government can't keep up, obviously, with the amount um, of aid that they need. The aid agencies are also struggling. Um, so what we're doing is we're documenting this, and then we're going to present it in such a way that the audience will be able to see the stories. There'll be a map of the region. You'll be able to see where all the different stories come from. And then something different, which I think we all can relate to, is we see stories, really moving stories of crises that are developing, and you all say, oh, what, what can I do? Uh, if you can believe it, I actually got an email from Francine Bremer, the wife of Bremer of Iraq, uh, who saw a picture of the Yazidis and sent me an email saying, I am so sorry to see that. What can I do to help? Now, unless you know a photographer or a journalist or somebody on the ground there, it's very difficult to reach out and, and, and help in a, in a direct way. So one of the things we're doing with the website as we develop it is a way for the audience to then be able to get in touch with the photographer or the producer or the journalist and say, I want to do some sort of uh, direct engagement with either that family or the community or the crisis at hand. Um, and again, watch this space. I will be talking a lot more about this in the months to come. Um, this is a project that Aram Karim, the guy I was telling you about, did. It's called Hotel Refugee. Um, about a uh, hotel that houses a number of different uh, IDPs and refugees. This is a project that a photographer, Haure Khalid, did in uh, one of the camps in Kirkuk. And you can see in the quality of his photography that he didn't go once or twice. Um, Stefano, our editor, sent Howry back 16 times to the camp to, to fix it. And then the final story is of a, a displaced Christians done by one of our few we do have a few female photographers um, about uh, displaced Iraqi Christians. And you can see here, this level of intimacy is rarely, rarely seen um, in Iraqi photography. Um, Iraqis are very private um, and it takes a lot of time sitting around without taking pictures to let people open up to you and trust you and trust that you'll do the right thing with the photographs. And that's it. Thank you guys very much. Very, of course, I think, Sebastian, you've made a very provocative point, and which is, I think, a valid point in terms of defending um, tr what it means to, to train people and to um, give them sort of the professional skills and recognizing journalism as a, as a profession. Um, so to be clear, for those, I mean, I don't think you, you went into it, but a lot of the people who are working with the agency, I think at one point there were maybe 60 photographers, they're all doing other things, right? They're, some of them are students, some of them are working as a cook, et cetera. Can you talk? I mean, I'd like actually all of you to speak a bit about this question of working with people who, or sourcing people, uh, material from people who are not professionals or maybe learning to become one. Um, so the, is it, is it, yeah, yeah it's on, okay. Um, the fu funding in journalism, especially photojournalism, is not 
solely a not you know a developing world issue. It's we all all photojournalists struggle with finding ways to fund ourselves. So um, our photographers can't survive. Many of them can't survive on photography alone, um, especially because so few assignments do come to them, and um, because local media, because there's a huge, one thing we should also mention this evening is local media, that I've shown you stories from Iraq to America, but you've got to understand that Iraqis have satellite TV and high-speed broadband and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and you know, it, 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 they have their own media. The problem is that a photo story in Iraqi media will, I think, you, is about $15, for a whole photo story. So it's not really a way to make money. So a lot of our photographers do have second jobs. We actually had um, one of our photographers was a Kurdish Peshmerga, a Kurdish soldier, Kurdish Iraqi soldier, um, and did some amazing um, stuff. A little, you know, one of the things I haven't shown you is frontline stuff because I'm not actually um, that interested <laughs> in, in frontline stuff. That's wire breaking news and it, it is important, but not, not for us. Um, and what he was able to do was to give us life inside the Kurdish Peshmerga, life inside um, the camps, what it was like to be a soldier fighting ISIS. Um, one of the risks of doing that kind of work, being a soldier as well as a photographer, is it's a dangerous, both are dangerous, and very sadly he was, um, he was shot in the head by a sniper about two weeks ago. He survived, but you know, it's a very, you know, very, very lucky survival. Um, whether or not he'll be able to photograph anymore, I don't know. But um, the point that I'm trying to make is that all of our photographers do have other sources of income, and that's not going to change. What, what has the process been like to, to train them? If you could say a little bit about that, because then I want to go to Michael and ask something similar. Sure. I mean, what, what they have, which I'm sure your journalists and your, you, the people who participate in your program, is they have a passion for what they do. Our guys are passionate about photography, even if it's a second job. Um, so training them is very easy. We, I mean, it's very difficult because we have to bring people in, but once we bring them in, their passion and their excitement to do the workshops that we provide is, you know, exceptional. So on the other scope of things, um, Maybe actually, Kavita, we'll, we'll just on that note in terms of the app. So the premise with the app is that everyday people, anybody, can use it, report a story. Uh, you had some metric about how many people are using it anonymously. They can share information that um, may be breaking news. It may be a tip. It may be what is it and how do you get people to think about how to, how to use it, what to post, how to follow up. Um, to make it the most effective? Um, so I agree with Sebastian that we do need stories like these because they not only move you, but they also make people to take a bigger action, especially in the institutional level. But I also feel like that there is always a point of start, and even for photographer to decide where he or she has to go and do a story, is that's where a platform like Vmind comes in the picture. Uh, we completely believe that uh, the whole thought started when we said, if you see anything around you, if there is an issue, there is a story, there is an expression, which you mind, just use we mind. We started from there. And when we actually created, we thought that people are just going to come and talk about, oh, I saw a car accident, or I saw somebody jumping a red light, or to go to more serious thing and see and talk about a child harassment case in uh, Egypt. But then once we, start, once we started seeing the stories, we also started seeing beautiful stories coming from uh, the Gulf area, where the only access to the outside world for most of the women are using their cell phones. So there, was a, there is this uh, anonymous, uh, um, anonymous V-minder, and I'm guessing it's she. Uh, every alternate day, we get a story about problems in dating in Saudi Arabia. So that's also a part of WeMind, but the type of things which, is, which I mentioned are like just tell you the lifestyle and the life and the issues, and at the same time, what's the local culture and what are the issues they are facing, which is very important for them, may not be that important for us right now sitting over here. So I, so I just feel like the users who comes on the app is just not about they have to wait for something really bad or really good to happen. It's also something about small things, about the culture, which usually we feel like it's a part of life or it's a way of life, which actually not for a lot of other cultures. So 
But what is, is there a fine line though between um, distinguishing you can sort of share what you want, which is very different from Facebook in that way, which people also share what they want. Like how do users know the context or the, or the type of content to post? Um, if there is something which, for which you have to go anonymous, you already know that's not for Facebook, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, there are even like, uh, there was a very uh, good, uh, there was a very good point which I picked uh, sitting at Stanford. One of the students said, uh, she comes from Syria, and, but she's born and brought up here. And she's like, every time there's something happening in Middle East and I'm over here and I need to get into finance next once I graduate, I don't know how strongly should I go on Twitter and Facebook and put my identity and talk about either side. How is that going to hurt me? Mm -hmm. But she has a strong opinion. <laughs> she wants the world to know. She keeps on getting these WhatsApp images and pictures live from the sites through her cousins and everyone. And she wants to put it out and tell people what's really happening. And she already knows there is no choice. There is just free money. Mm -hmm. So Michael, you have, we were talking b earlier, you've worked with different groups of people in a number of different ways. Um, you told me about your work in theater and doing theater pieces based on interviews, um, having interviews and um, giving it to a dance company and having it interpreted into dance performances. Um, what has it been like to work, what is I guess your philosophy behind training people to get their head around what this process is and being able to participate it, participate in it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, how do I answer that? That's, uh, that's a big question. I think, um, firstly, to uh, as a roundabout way to get there, something that's beautiful about your previous comment about the mundane that is, is a segue into the answer is that the field is littered with technology that no one uses, um, or companies have tried to build with the assumption that if they build it, they will come. And in a lot of ways, why these popular platforms like Facebook and et cetera, et cetera, become such powerful in these moments of crisis is because people have integrated them into the, their everyday and share the mundane. And in that process of sharing the mundane, it's absolutely critical so that when there's a moment of crisis, they're, they're, they're susceptible and ready to share. And so that thinking has also kind of infer informed our, my exploration of trying to express these stories through all these different platforms. Because there's many different people who experience things many different way. You know, the experiment of working with dancers was this sort of like, exploration of how people express through gesticulation and how we can get to the emotion of a story that is different from seeing an image or reading some words, but how do you take an image and a word and translate it through the human body for people who, uh, who, experiencing things, who experience things like that. Same with theater. We're interested in like creating investigations about the mundane and the everyday things about people's lives that are incredibly important. We did this uh, in South Africa. I uh, did this uh, show that was based on this photo essay and these audio documentaries that we were doing that was based on um, how to deal with people in your community of HIV. At that moment, the people were highly stigmatized. People were uh, being killed or ostracized from their community. So we did a series of interviews, and based on those interviews, those interviews became this kind of like living newspaper in the sort of WPA uh, depression era style where we would be sharing these stories based on real interviews that were interactive with the audience. And it was just one more way of dealing with a community that was used to dealing with performance as a ritual experience of communicating information. And because they were used to you know, communicating the mundane through these ritual experiences, we, had, we were exploring with the viability of expressing information through that pathway. So something that um, has occurred to me as I've been talking to all of you is that two things. One, each of you are sort of dealing with everyday people in one way or another. With Sebastian, it's a bit different because these are people that you have maybe found, recruited, trained to become professionals. But you have a, you have a very particular position to traditional media, mainstream media. And some people hear about these kinds of projects and they feel very, by some people, I mean um, professionals, feel very threatened in a way by citizen journalism, uh, this is not valid to tell stories this way, et cetera. Yet it seems that um, for at least two of you, 
a relationship to traditional media is crucial. So we all clapped when um, you know a project is going to be seen on Lens and with Kavita. I know you've talked about maybe somebody will see something on WeMind and pick it up for someone else to to um, take it over. So what do you think about this sort of relationship being outside of it, need like being able to be independent? Um, but does it does it still mean? Let me back up, actually, and clarify my point. There are a lot of people who, think, when they're thinking about new media and the internet, are very um, utopian, and they speak in the way that the internet is super self-contained, and we can do it all, and we're just going to crowdsource everybody. But there's still a relationship to the outside world, right, in order to even get the message across in some cases, in order for people to be able to see, see pictures of Iraqi daily life, which nobody will be able to see. Um, I watched a news clip of you on the um, on Kenyan television, and they were, you know, talking about maybe this will become a resource for us. So, what do you? How do you see those kinds of relationships between what you're doing and? Does that make sense? with Al Jazeera Press to basically create a back end. Um, oh, okay. Um, don't judge me on technology just based on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, we do create partnership with the mainstream media houses to give them the feed of everything which is trending, which people are really talking about, something which we feel at like mind is uh, breaking news and it should go to the mainstream media because at the end of the day, nobody can underestimate the power of mainstream media and the audiences they have. We see ourselves as a link in the middle mm -hmm. where we can tell them that these stories are important, there are already movement around it and they need to take a serious look at those stories. So your goal would be, would you say, what you're, to change the kinds of stories that get reported? Yeah, and a lot of stories which uh, just because of whatever reason, they never make it outside the city or the country or because of whatever reason mainstream media for monetary purposes do not pick it up. We show them the movement and the interest of people, how many people are talking about it, give them all the stats and then say it's an impact story. Even if one of them pick up, it can create a lot of impact back home in that story. Michael, is that important to you? Um, the, the relationship with mainstream media? Absolutely. I mean... Um, w I think, w despite the, all the new in the words that that we talk when people talk about our work, what we do is not dissimilar from what Nellie Bly was doing a hundred years ago. In some ways, mm -hmm. I think um, the 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 question is is how is the the news mainstream media going to reevaluate its relationship to power and maintaining a specific uh, a specific status quo as that status quo you know, becomes the minority, right? And so we're in this, we're in this sort of generational shift that you can chart from the latest wave of social movements uh, designated at, you know, you know, loosely around the Tunisian revolutions to Kinsey MA, what's happening in Senegal, Occupy, Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. That is a demonstration, in my opinion, of the, after 300 years of sort of representational democracy and consumer capitalism, this relationship, this redefining the relationship that have that people have between their community and their directly, their potential for dir to directly participate in democratic decisions that govern their lives. And that's what we're seeing around the world. And journalism is just a little bit behind that, right? Mm -hmm. I think Al Jazeera Plus is a great example. Like a Al Jazeera Plus doesn't have a website. Like the website is a thing of the past. It's not, the, you know, homepages are dead. The website, websites are dead in many ways. How people are sharing um, stories in some ways, and not at this moment, but that's what we're going to experience in the next 20 years. And that's why in what Al Jazeera Plus is doing is, is brilliant because they don't, they don't expect people to come to their home page. They're meeting their, their audience where they're at. So they're sharing stuff that's on Instagram, it's separate content that's on Facebook, that's separate content, that's, that's, that's shared through all these other platforms, not dissimilar to uh, people sharing books back in the day where they're sort of spreading that through person to person. People yeah. aren't expecting people I'm to come. I'm not familiar with Al Jazeera Plus, actually. Maybe someone to say I two cents. I something out here. Yes. Um, I want to share a story because of your point on the web, and that's a personal story. Uh, we started, when we started on vMind, we started on an iPhone application. 
and we were living in this amazing bubble of San Francisco, <laughs> where we went, we created the best app, put all the technology, and then with that technology, we landed up in Nairobi. And between the whole East Africa, and I'm talking about four countries, there were only three iPhones available. <laughs> and, and we were like, oh, we are here to talk about how you guys can freely express, but there was no platform which they can use to express. And then we started tracing back the technology, which you can either call going back, or you can say it in a more innovative way. But finally, after doing the application, after going on Android, we had to go back and do a web application. Because uh, the, most of the stories in today's time, which are actually creating a lot of social impact, the places which they are coming from, uh, are the places which still do not have a smartphone penetration. Okay. So I, I just wanted to say that like web application today is still, for a lot of people, is still one of the most technical uh, advancement in our experience at VMind. I want to hear from Sebastian, but I'm going to add to that for two seconds, which is um, I know from my, and I realize I didn't introduce myself, but to give everyone context, I am the co-founder of the Bronx Documentary Center. So it's a gallery showing documentary film photography right in a storefront in the South Bronx. And a lot of people in our community did not have smart, did not have internet, first of all. Um, so when we get into these conversations about well, utopia of the internet, I'm always skeptical. But also in terms of just understanding like what phone does a person have? A lot of people do not have smartphones as well. Um, you, Michael, though, did use the Vojo technology. You chose to use it recognizing that everyone doesn't have that same access. So it's it's text SMS. That's you know. Yeah, that's exactly why why we use text SMS because I didn't. We didn't want to create another app that maybe some of people may or may not use. We wanted to use what people have in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And people, everyone has who has a phone has this text messaging ability, right? Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it was, yeah, it was our choice. And we've used that in, you know, there's a, it's now being translated into Portuguese. We're doing a Brazilian rollout and we do it in South Africa. And we, we like that option because people have text messages and they can receive news and information via text message as well as transmit that information. Sebastian, I feel like you had a thought or a face or an expression. We were talking got, I've about. I've always got a face about. I want to hear it. We were talking about the the relationship. Um, I mean, I <clears throat> I agree um, that you know for us the gold standard still remains the mainstream media. They have the biggest outreach for the stuff for the for the stories, uh, the biggest audience for the stories that we're producing. So getting stuff in um, spreads in New York Times, Washington Post um, are a big deal for us. The um, Sinjar story, the first one I showed, was featured in the eight-minute documentary for Channel 4 News in the UK. Um, that, was, that was amazing for us. It was huge. Um, and it still remains our, our goal. Um, one of the things I brought up very briefly before, and I'll touch on very briefly now, is that the audience tonight um, is everyone here in America. Um, the audience, a lot of the time, you know, in Iraq, uh, are Iraqis, the audience is, is, is Iraq. Um, and Iraqis use Facebook in, a w in such a way that many of my friends, my Iraqi friends, don't know the difference between the internet and Facebook. I mean, I've had people say, where did you see that? And they said, oh, I saw it on the internet. And I was like, you mean Facebook? And they said, yeah, the internet, Facebook. The um, same, in, same in rural Canada with this community we're working with, right. the, the internet is Facebook. Yeah. And they don't even have any phones or internet in their house, but they have it on their phone. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> um, and, and so, f you know, getting into, into platforms, I mean, in terms of, you know, the, the, the media, a lot of people will just, you know, upload stuff straight to there. So we're, in some ways, we're talking about different audiences, but that was the answer to your question.